Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's lunchtime conversation. My name is Ann Mason. I'm the executive director of the Plymouth Antiquarian Society, and I'm always delighted to connect with you virtually so we can discuss local history. We can share a little bit about um, items from our collection and ongoing research that's happening locally and hopefully just introduce you to a uh, part of the past that maybe you had not um, thought about before, or discovered or explored before. So that's the purpose of these lunchtime conversations. And we do have all of our programs recorded and available for you on our website, PlymouthAntiquarian.org slash lunchtime hyphen conversations. So you can go and see any of the programs you might have missed, or if you want to rewatch something, feel free to visit that site. And this program is being recorded and will be added there as soon as we're able to process it. I wanted to mention that this program is supported by a grant from the Bridge Street Fund, a special initiative of Mass Humanities, which is um, supported by the Mass Cultural Council. And we're so thankful for their support for this program and then the previous two lunchtime conversations that were presented virtually. And I also wanted to take a moment to acknowledge our corporate sponsors. The Plymouth Antiquarian Society is a nonprofit organization, and we really depend on our community organizations and local businesses who support us in so many ways, including financially. So thanks to our gold sponsor, Tracy Chevrolet Cadillac, and all of our other sponsors. All right, well, um, as we start today's program, I do want to remind you that if you're watching through Zoom, you can use the chat box to send any comments, to send greetings to me or to one another. We always like to um, know who's who's tuning in and share and feel free to share your thoughts. Uh, you can also use the Q&A feature to ask any questions about the content of today's program. And then if you're watching the stream on Facebook, um, please do use uh, the comment field to send any questions. And if we can't get anything, if I can't get to all of them today, or if I miss seeing them while we're doing the live program, I will go back and try to answer your questions later so that you um, have, have hopefully, if I don't have the answer, I can hopefully provide you with a, a way for you to find the answer on your own. So we'll be talking about different resources today that we do have available on this topic, which is Plymouth Industrial Past. Now, many visitors to Plymouth today, um, I think probably just think of it as a quaint seaside community. Um, even if you've lived in Plymouth for a long time, sometimes it's hard to get beyond the poker monuments and the ice cream shops and the seafood um, takeout options on the waterfront and to think about Plymouth in an earlier period when it looked um, incredibly different and the economy was different and uh, just the, the whole landscape of the town was, was really shaped by the industrial endeavors that had been in place um, really since the 17th century. So uh, when we talk about industry, we can talk about all sorts of enterprises and um, talk about the mills starting in the 17th century, the grist mills, um, all the way up onto the 19th century, the later 19th century, where we have these massive factories downtown. So I thought we would um, start by just, or, or start and use throughout this program as a guide, this 1882 bird's eye view of Plymouth, which I absolutely love. And uh, we have actually prints of this bird's eye view available in our gift shop if you're interested. Um, but what's wonderful about bird's eye views done in the 19th and 20th century is they really do show so much detail. And if you have a good scan, you can zoom right in and see all of those details. So what I've done is uh, zoomed in and highlighted different spots that we're going to talk about as we go through. Um, and really just looking at this map, this, this bird's eye view um, and a zoomed out version, I think you can, you can see that some things are familiar um, and some things are um, not familiar at all. So when we look at um, you know, just the, the zoomed out version, we can see that there's water here. So that is the harbor as it is marked. So we say, okay, that's familiar. And if you could um, actually have a copy in front of you to read the street names, you'd see that the street names are um, mostly the same. The street layout is mostly the same. There are some changes. And then you might notice some of the, the buildings look familiar. Um, and over on the far right here, we do have a monument that is very familiar. That is the Forefathers Monument. 
there it is marked on the map there. Um, and so you can, here's a zoom in of that Forefathers Monument. Now what's interesting is, as you can see from the photograph, the figure of Faith, which is at the top of the monument, um, she has her right arm raised pointing up and on the bird's eye view, it's actually her left arm is raised. And so this is just a reminder, you always need to um, filter your sources. So make sure you're you're interrogating them because they're, you can't always take everything at face value, um, it, whether it's written or a visual source. Um, this bird's eye view, as I mentioned, was done in 1882. The Forefathers Monument was not completed until 1888 and dedicated in 1889. So probably the plans existed. They'd been working on it for years and years. So probably whoever created this bird's eye view just got the, the arms backwards. But I always think that's kind of an interesting little um, error to point out on this bird's eye view map. But again, we have familiar things that we can see in the bird's eye view from 1882. What about the things that look very different? <laughs> well, I think probably what we notice um, first are these insets with different uh, drawings of factory buildings. And that's always something that fascinates me. And a lot of these um, bird's eye views or maps of different um, towns and cities throughout the country. So um, views like this were made, atlases pr were produced um, really to show people uh, the different landscapes of the United States. And often factories are highlighted. Um, these are the source of the community's wealth and they're um, in many ways a source of community pride in this period, um, showing sort of, again, the industrial strength of, of a certain town. Um, Plymouth, of course, is never going to grow in size to be a city like Lowell, Massachusetts, um, but we do have these prominent factories on display here. And then the other thing that really strikes me uh, just at first glance here in 1882 are the wharves in the harbor, and let's zoom in on them. Um, so here we have a number of wharves stretched out into the harbor, shipping wharves, a lot of um, warehouses, counting houses located on the wharves. So this is where all of Plymouth um, goods were coming in um, from all over the world. You can see some of the sailing vessels depicted there. And then right smack in the middle of all of this, of this commercial activity, we have Plymouth Rock and the old Billings canopy that used to be on top of it. So that was a... Um, 19th century structure built over Plymouth Rock. And here we have a photograph. Now this photograph was probably taken right on the eve of the tercentenary. So Plymouth's 300th anniversary in 1920, um, right at that time is when Pilgrim Memorial State Park was created. And in order to create Pilgrim Memorial State Park, um, all of the wharves and the buildings that you see here were taken down um, in many cases. Uh, just completely bulldozed, demolished, um, and removed so that we can have, as we do today, a beautiful green space. Um, and that Billings canopy, which you can see at the center of the photograph, was replaced by the McKinn, Mead, and White canopy that we have today. So that was all for Plymouth's 300th anniversary. But again, 1882, Plymouth looks different. Even when this photograph was taken, probably 1919, 1920, uh, very different from what we're used to seeing today. Even though you, you are, if you're familiar with Plymouth, you can tell that's Coles Hill. Um, and one thing again, as we're gonna focus on today, we have this smokestack to the, um, in the back there on the left-hand side. And uh, we don't have smokestacks in downtown Plymouth anymore. So we're gonna talk about that as we go along. So what I'd like to do is, is use these bird's eye view, this one and a later one, use other maps and photographs to highlight some of the 19th and 20th century factories that once stood on Plymouth's waterfront and really just provide a very brief introduction to the industrial landscape that is largely invisible today. And I wanted to thank um, local historian Jim Baker, who has done extensive research on Plymouth's industries. And so that was really incredibly helpful to me while researching for this um, program. And he also has made many of his personal collections of historic photographs of Plymouth available online. So those are wonderful resources for us. And as we go, you'll see some of the photographs is marked um, courtesy of James Baker. Some of them, most of them are from our collection here at the Antiquarian Society, uh, like this one that I'm showing you now. Um, and others come from other repositories that are um, captioned on the photographs. 
So I'm not going to be able to cover all of the factories and I'm not going to be um, going anywhere else beyond the waterfront itself. So this is a very, has a very narrow focus as a tour. Um, we'll probably have to do a part two where we, I can talk about some of the earlier industries um, that were in other parts of the town. But again, I keep using that term industry. So I want to more clearly define it just so you know what, um, what, I'm, what I'm really focusing on today. Um, industry can mean many different things. Um, we often use it to refer to a type of commercial or economic activity, a business, a trade. So we might talk about the shipping and shipbuilding industry or the fishing industry, the whaling industry. And of course, those were important industries in Plymouth. Um, but industry today for our tour, we're going to be focusing on economic activities um, that are concerned with the processing of raw materials and the manufacturing of goods in factories using machines. So this is something that's happening. Uh, often we'll talk about a period called the Industrial Revolution that was quite a, very, a, a long and gradual revolution that shaped um, the economies of many Western countries, including, of course, the United States. So we're going to focus on um, as I said, the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century here in the Plymouth waterfront where we do have industries where the defining characteristics work is happening in factories with machines producing um, raw, taking raw materials and producing goods that can be sold around the world. All right. So that's just our little introduction. And I hope that as we go, you'll be able to just imagine the Plymouth waterfront. If you live in Plymouth or if you visit Plymouth frequently, hopefully you can store this information um, for the, your next walk down the waterfront. And as you go, you can say, oh, that's, that's that site that Anne mentioned where this used to be and it's not there anymore. Um, so this is something that hopefully will um, help you understand better what existed in downtown Plymouth uh, before, really before uh, the 1950s. Um, okay, so um, just as we think about industrial development, just to set the stage, I want to think about what it requires. What do you need to have available in order to industrialize? Um, so you need, I've sort of it broken, broken it down into five basic categories. First, you need capital. So if you're going to um, create a factory space and, and, and bring machines into that space, if you're going to buy a bunch of raw goods to make something out of, um, that takes a lot of um, startup. Um, uh, money. You need the startup fund in order to create a factory. And indeed, there was capital in Plymouth that was ready to be invested. There were different families who um, had an entrepreneurial spirit and were willing to take risks. Some of them had um, gathered, you know, some fortune out of the shipping, out of shipping or shipbuilding or some of the earlier um, related industries, and they were ready to invest that money somewhere else into a larger factory. And uh, families like the Russells, for example, here in Plymouth, Nathaniel Russell was really one of Plymouth's first industrialist and leading industrialist. But there were also banks in Plymouth, um, a number of local banks founded in the 19th century, um, though which again were providing a capital for these investments. And a uh, second thing that you need is a workforce. So we're not really going to talk about the workforce, um, the people who actually worked in these factories today, but um, basically what happened is you have more efficient food production, which means not everyone needs to be a farmer. So over the centuries, as food production um, becomes more and more efficient, people are free to work in other jobs. Um, and so this also allows for, for greater population growth within the country because there's enough food to feed people. Um, but you also have, of course, um, population growing because of immigration. And so we have different um, groups coming into Plymouth. We have first the Irish and Germans, then later Italians, Portuguese, French Canadians. Um, and so we have this boom in population, this um, change in the uh, demographics of Plymouth, uh, new ethnic communities coming in, um, new languages being spoken, new um, religious practices. Um, but you know, one of the things that is drawing these immigrant populations to Plymouth as it's drawing them to other urban areas in the United States um, are these factories, are these mills that are looking for a lot of people to employ. So you have to have capital, you have to have work for the workforce. And third, which we're finally going to be able to talk about this image that I've had in front of me for a while, um, the third thing you need is energy. Now, um, 
industrialization can't happen if you're solely relying on human and animal power. Um, so the earliest industrialization uses things like water power and wind power. Um, so which is why you would have a grist mill, for example, in the 17th century, which is a very important building for grinding all of your grain, um, but you would have that based near a water source. Um, and so the earliest industry in Plymouth really happens along Town Brook, um, and it's a series of dams on Town Brook that create um, the water power, the source for the water power for those different mills. Um, but as the centuries move along, you have other sources of power. So water and wind, you have coal, um, electricity, oil, gas, all of these um, different things over time become more and more available. Um, and here in Plymouth, so as we shift away from solely relying on water power, here in Plymouth in the second half of the 19th century, you have new energy sources that really allow industrialization, industrial development to move away from Town Brook and other waterways like the Eel River, moving away from there and moving um, onto the waterfront. And so I have circled here at the center of the 1882 bird's eye view, the Plymouth Gaslight Company. Um, and let's go and get a closer look at this. So this, as you can see, was located on the south side of Howland Street. It was founded in 1854. And gas is, is really a new source of energy in that, in that period, in the mid 19th century. Um, we don't, you know, moving away from, from wood, um, even moving away from coal to some extent, and you have gas as a source for light and for heat. Here is a, um, an image taken from the Sanborn Fire Insurance map from 1885, so roughly the same time that the uh, bird's eye view of Plymouth was created. Um, but this shows, uh, let me back up, fire insurance ma maps are really a wonderful resource if you're interested in how the landscape has changed. If you live in a historic house and are interested in sort of figuring out maybe when additions were added or taken off, um, because basically, um, the, the insurance companies want to know, you know, what they're covering. And so they're going and making detailed drawings of towns like Plymouth. Um, and usually if you if you live outside the downtown, you probably might not be able to find a drawing of your house. It might not be included. It really is focusing on these downtown areas where, of course, as the name suggests, fire insurance, you're most concerned about fire. Um, and so what we have here is it's all color coded. So a yellow building is a building that's made out of uh, wood. Uh, um, and then you have other colors if it's made out of brick or if it has a, a brick end on it. And that helps the insurance company knows what the risk is. If you have a wooden building, then the chances are that it's going to burn very quickly, of course. Um, some of these smaller buildings you see, it's DW apostrophe G, that stands for dwelling. So those are smaller dwellings. Um, this street here on the left side of this image, that is Howland Street, and here we have Plymouth Gas Light Company, um, and you see it here in pink. Um, part of the, the building is for storage, so storing coal, um, and then you have a purifying chamber, and then um, over here is the iron gasometer, so that was actually in the previous photo we can or uh, the previous detail we can see that's that big tank right there um, where you're you're processing, um, you know, you're, you need a place to store to store the gas before you send it out. So that's right there on Howland Street. And um, so gas is one of these new sources of energies. We also have on the water, oh, and that's Howland Street today. So roughly the same location as the gas light company, um, uh, now, now condos. And then at the end of the street, the uh, former Governor Bradford Motel, now also condos. Um, but we, so there we have on the waterfront an example of, of one of these new industrial energy sources, gas. Um, the second one I wanna talk about is not on that 80, 1882 map, it's on a 1910 bird's eye view of Plymouth. Um, and as you can see from the caption, this map is actually courtesy of the Norman B. Leventhal Map and Education Center at the Boston Public Library. And I encourage all of you to visit. Um, it's a wonderful digital resource. They've, they have high resolution scans of many, many maps, um, including quite a few of Plymouth from different periods. And you can really, um, right on their website, zoom right in to see all sorts of detail on these maps. And so I love them. Um, obviously, this is a little bit uh, a, a 
much larger expanse of Plymouth that is being covered in this bird's eye view as opposed to the previous um, 1882 bird's eye view. So let's zoom in. Here is the basic waterfront area that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I want us to focus on the left-hand side of this image, uh, which is circled. And if we zoom in there, we see um, another, a number of smokestacks, again, which aren't in Plymouth, downtown Plymouth at all today. Um, so on the left, we'll get to that one um, soon. Um, in the middle here, um, that is actually right at the, the corner of Water Street and what is today Leiden Street. Um, and it's marked um, number 11 right here on the map. But this is actually um, the Plymouth Electric Light Company. So we talked about gas, now we have electricity being, um, this is an electric power station right here on the waterfront. Um, the Plymouth Electric Light Company was founded in 1887 and then it was sold to the Thompson Houston Electric Company in 1889. Um, and it was that company that built this brick power station in um, the 1890s, early 1890s. Um, Plymouth Electric Company maintained the building um, and it was it was there for, for, for a really long time. It wasn't actually demolished until the 1960s. Um, and I'll show you a photograph of that. So that's the first um, light company we're gonna talk about. The second one is right down here, and I'll get to that in a minute. Actually, since the photograph's here, I'll talk about that first. Um, that's actually the um, electrical power station right on Water Street, as you can see right behind or next to um, Plymouth Rock when it was in its um, 19th century location under the Billings canopy. Um, and that is really right about where the entrance to the State Wharf is. So if you're going to Mayflower 2, it's right about that there, right? That entrance at Water Street um, is where this other light station was. Um, and it was owned actually by the Plymouth and Kingston Street Rail Railway Company. They began service in 1889. They were later absorbed by the Brockton and Plymouth Street Railway Company. Um, and then this whole building and the smokestack was demolished, one of those buildings demolished um, in preparation for the Pilgrim Tercentenary of 1921. So again, that was when Pilgrim Memorial State Park was created. Um, the waterfront area was um, in many cases taken by eminent domain. There was a state commission that was in control of all of this. Um, so you had federal and state funds being used um, to tear down these buildings and create um, a beautiful park for visitors and residents to enjoy. And the rock itself was, was moved and reset and had a new canopy over it. So that's that um, a power station right here on the bottom right of that image. And here today, of course, um, again, if you're familiar with Plymouth, uh, we have a beautiful um, memorial park today where none of those buildings, including that smokestack for the electric power station, that's not there anymore. It's incredibly green right now because we've just had so much rain <laughs> for July. Um, it's, it's rather remarkable, but, and we also had a very foggy morning this morning when I took the photo. So um, you get a very different kind. It's not usually like that in the summer. All right, so jumping back then to um, the previous electric light company the, at the base of Leiden Street at the corner of Water Street. Um, this is that building being destroyed, demolished in the 1960s by a crane. Um, and you can see behind it in this photograph, which is um, one of Jim's, Jim Baker's photographs, you can see behind it um, the outline of the town brook. Um, and that's where Brewster Gardens is today. So Brewster Gardens was another area that was um, cleaned up for the tercentenary. And um, in the years really starting around 1914 and then going beyond the tercentenary, it took a while to create Brewster Gardens. Um, but this was the last building really that needed to be removed um, from that corner in order to create a beautiful entrance um, as we have today right there uh, for, the, for the Brewster Gardens. All right, so we've talked about energy. We talked about um, the um, uh, two electric light power stations, and then we talked about the gas station on Howland Street. So those are some of the, the smokestacks that you see here on this 1882 view um, that we don't have anymore, and uh, you would never know that they had been there. All right, so um, just to review our little checklist, to industrialize, you need capital. 
um, you need a workforce, you need energy, and fourth, you need materials. And how do you get materials? Well, you need to have capital to pay for them. And then you need to have, finally, um, transportation. So you need to have a way to get raw materials to your factories, and then you need to have a way to get your finished product from the factory off to market. And of course, um, and initially, this would really be done primarily by by sea, by, as you can see here in the harbor, we mentioned those wharves right there at Plymouth Harbor. Um, this is why they were there. They needed to get goods in and out of Plymouth um, and not just um, like what we might think of as consumer goods, but of course also um, fish and coal. Um, so a lot of really important products had to get into town somehow. Um, but in the 19th century, the, the second half of the 19th century, um, we have a new way to transport things throughout Plymouth um, and, to, and in and out of Plymouth. And that of course is the railroad as I've circled here on the map. So the railroad um, in Plymouth, the Old Colony Railroad was founded in 1844. Here's a detailed view of that. It opened in 1845 to service. And so they had a station at Seaside, which is North Plymouth, uh, up near the Plymouth Cordage Company, which we'll get to in a second. And then they had this station in downtown Plymouth, um, where Park Avenue is today in downtown Plymouth. And um, you can see that there's a, a beautiful station here that would, when passenger, tr passenger trains came in, people would exit the station um, and go up. Um, it says Depot Ave or Park Ave today um, to get to Court Street, which is the main thoroughfare through town. Um, and then it also has um, the auxiliary buildings for, um, for, the, for the trains themselves. The Old Colony Railroad did expand. They um, opened branch lines in other towns south of Boston, but they were bought by the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad in 1893. Um, and so that they did change ownership at that point. Here are some different photographs of the railroad station uh, at different points. This is uh, obviously a, a photograph. And then here we have uh, postcard photograph view. So it's a lovely little station. Um, here we have an aerial view of, of Plymouth um, where you can see um, that the, the train lines very clearly are coming in and uh, the train station um, uh, was, was still there at this point. This is in the 1950s, um, but passenger service did end in 1959. Um, and why did, why, why did the railroad end, not just in Plymouth, but also around the country? Um, well, really because of cars. And so you now have um, other ways of transporting both people and goods, the highways sort of take over. Um, and you also, in Plymouth locally, you have a decline in the mills um, that were using the, the, the railroad as the primary means of, of getting things in and out. Um, so all of these things are happening at, around the same time, but passenger service did end in Plymouth in 1959. And of course, was reborn um, several decades later, and we do have passenger service today, although not all the way down to the waterfront as it used to be. Um, the station, of course, stops at, at Cordage, the old Cordage. Um, but you can take the rail trail and walk or bike um, the old rail line from Cordage um, down to, um, I think it's Lothrop Street actually, all the way down there now. And here we have just a photograph showing um, Park Avenue, South Park Avenue, and uh, it really was supposed to be this grand entrance to Plymouth. Um, so you could sort of have this lovely walk down to the railroad station um, or up from the railroad station to get to Court Street. Um, and really none of that survives today. Um, the railroad station was pretty much located where Citizens Bank is and their, their big parking lot, all of, all of that of course is gone. All right. So now that we've talked about what you actually need to industrialize and um, thought a little bit about why um, industries would start to open up downtown. Now they have energy. They don't need to have water power. So they're not, they don't have to be next to the town brook or any of a river. Um, they have the railroad station right there, which is a great asset for getting things in and out. Some of them still do use um, water power. Of course, they're still sending goods out um, on those wharves on ships. 
Um, but let's actually take sort of a, a stroll down the waterfront, down Water Street, um, from the south to the north, um, and think about and look at some of these major industries um, in the 19th and 20th centuries. And we're going to start um, at the far end, uh, the left side, the south side of um, this map, where, as I have circled, this is the Plymouth Foundry Company. So I said earlier, there's one smokestack that I'm not going to talk about about now, we'll talk about it later, and now is the time. So here again is um, a detailed view from that 80, 1882 bird's eye view showing the Plymouth Foundry Company. Um, so actually William Drew founded a small foundry at the mouth of the town brook in the 1840s, um, and that burnt and then was rebuilt and then eventually incorporated in 1866 as the Plymouth Foundry Company. Um, and they primarily built cast iron stoves um, often they, they, you could really cast anything, pots, kettles, um, but they really advertise their stoves. Here is a, uh, another view from that same 1882 bird's eye view, but this is one of those insets that really highlights um, those, those different factories. So there you get a be better angle on the Plymouth Foundry Company. You can see what an extensive um, area that is right at the mouth of Town Brook. And then um, thinking about the cast iron stoves that they actually did make. We have one in the Antiquarian Society's collection. It's actually in our Spooner house on North Street. This is um, the only object or one of the very few objects in the house that does not have a Spooner family connection. So um, the Spooner house was left to us with all of its contents um, from generations of Spooners who lived in the house. Um, and then later, I believe in the 1970s, the Antiquarian Society was offered this stove as a donation and um, installed it in the Spooner house since we knew that a cast iron stove had been there. This is in the kitchen um, and we didn't have one at the time so it seemed a good spot for one and it was really um, a remarkable piece that we wouldn't want to pass um, on the chance to have. Um, it, it was made here in Plymouth in the Plymouth Foundry so almost a stone's throw from where it sits today. Um, if you look here on the, you have uh, the smaller door on the left hand side of the stove, you have a scallop shell with Plymouth Rock and 1620 written on it, um, depicted there. And then of the door of the um, stove itself, the larger door, you actually have a depiction of the landing of the pilgrims. And there's a closer view. Um, so this is uh, this is done in cast iron, which elsewhere was popularized in prints and um, uh, transferware patterns on plates. Uh, really, that image that everyone sort of has in their mind, um, very, very inaccurate in terms of probably what the landing actually was like in 1620. Um, but you do have generally here's Miles Standish at the center in, in, in his armor and um, you have an, a native person who's who's greeting them. Um, but that's the that's the depiction that they had. They had this was clearly a Plymouth stove. If you had this in your house in your kitchen for cooking, um, you would think of Plymouth um, for sure. You couldn't miss it. So this is one of my um, I love this photograph. Um, it shows the Plymouth Foundry Company in the background, and then in the foreground you see this funny little log cabin. Now this was taken at the time of the tercentenary, which I've already mentioned several times, um, but this of course was the commemoration of 300th anniversary of the landing of the pilgrims. And um, this photograph comes from a collection that has been digitized um, by the Plymouth Public Library. So you can go on their website and find many, many photographs of the tercentenary pageant and parade that were held in 1921. And then also some great photographs just of, of downtown Plymouth and the waterfront, which can give you a feel for what was there before Pilgrim Memorial State Park, um, and then sort of in the transition um, in 1920, 1921. And so this was a little log cabin um, actually given by a gentleman named Frank Gregg of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, he, he, he called it a replica of the first house on Leiden Street. And so um, he sent it to Plymouth and it was uh, erected here on um, pretty much close to the end of Leiden Street. Although this building that you see to the left um, is the, um, that as we mentioned earlier, the Plymouth Electric Light Company. But um, we know now that uh, the Pilgrims did not build log cabins when they first settled in Plymouth um, or ever. 
um, if you want to see, you know, what types of houses they were building, that's, you know, we have a wonderful uh, recreated village at Plymouth Patuxet. Um, but in any case, this is the site of the first houses uh, that they built on Leiden Street, the first street laid out in Plymouth. Um, so they got the location correct, but not the design. But in any case, this is what visitors to Plymouth in 1921 would see. Um, so it's interesting, again, to think today we have a waterfront that really is shaped by um, trying to make things attractive for visitors, for tourists, for residents, you know, the, the parks, the greens, the monuments, um, beautiful sidewalks. Um, but in 1921, that was, it was still very much a working industrial commercial district. So even though they had demolished quite a bit of um, uh, of some of, of the waterfront of Water Street, um, uh, some factories like the Plymouth Foundry Company did survive. So that's why it's there in the background. Um, but eventually what happens is that businesses starts to decrease. So of course people stop using cast iron stoves. They change to gas and electric stoves and then central heating. So you don't have as much demand for cast iron products. Um, there are a number of shifts in management and then um, the Plymouth Foundry Company closed in 1935. And many of the buildings were demolished. Um, parts of one of the buildings survived and it's one of the few buildings that really hints back at that industrial past on the waterfront um, here where we have zebra visuals today. Although of course it was, it was significantly altered um, in order to make it into more of a, a commercial space um, with the, the marina behind it. All right. So that was our first um, factory that I wanted to, to take us um, past on Water Street. Um, and then again, looking at the 1882 bird's eye view, if we walk up Water Street, again, we see all these small buildings that were demolished to create Pilgrim Memorial State Park. We see Plymouth Rock, which was um, altered, um, put under a new canopy. Um, but if we continue along Water Street um, on the sort of the other side, um, of Water Street past where the Mayflower 2 is today. Um, we, again, if in 1882, we would look up Howland Street and see the, um, the gas company. But then we get to these two open spaces on the map, which, um, you know, are a little bit strange because I think we, we're so used to seeing all the waterfront space full, filled. Um, and this is a true in 1882 that the, these were open. Um, certainly a lot of commercial activities did happen in these spaces. It's not like they were just um, some kind of park space. Um, in fact, for many years, there would be um, different endeavors connected to the fishing industry. So like fish drying, fish flaking here on, in this area. Um, but if we jump ahead, so we're gonna jump ahead again, 30 years to look at that 1910 bird's eye view. Um, and we can, again, here's sort of the same section of waterfront that we've been looking at with the 1882 map, but now we're in 1910, things have shifted a little bit. And we're going to see that those spaces that were empty in 1882 have now been filled in within those 30 years. Um, so let's first look at this building right here. This is a large factory on the corner of Howland Street and Water Street with a smokestack. Um, that was actually the location of George P. Mabbitt and Sons Woolen Company. Now there were a number of textile uh, mills in Plymouth. Um, again, we, we didn't talk about them because they're um, some of them, the earlier ones were along Town Brook and the Eel River. Um, but this one here on Water Street was created by George Mabbitt um, after he retired from one of those other mills. So he worked for the Standish Worsted Company and he retired and then he founded his own company in 1900 on Water Street, um, as I said, right between Chilton Street and Howland Street on, on the corner of Water Street. Um, there had actually been other factories here. So 1882, this looked like empty space. In the 1890s, there were actually shoe factories located there. Um, but the Mabbitt Mills replaced those factories in 1900. Um, and they, they were able to expand over the years. 
they focus um, after World War I, so after about 1918, they really focus on um, producing the finest worsted material for men's suits, and they do quite well with that. So even in the 1920s, they're still expanding operation, um, and they do keep up with technological changes. So um, they, they install automatic looms in their factory, um, and they end up continuing long after many of the other mills in Plymouth closed, um, and they did not close until the 1960s. Um, so I'm sure many of you remember Mabbit Mills very well. <laughs> um, but if we move right along, so there we have a major wool um, textile mill right there on the waterfront. And here um, in this photograph, we can actually see um, Mabbit's um, here in the background. Um, as you're basically to orient you, you're pretty much standing roughly where the state pier would be today looking north. Um, and you can see Mabbit is that low lying um, building right there um, the, between Howland Street and Chilton Street today. Um, here's a postcard view showing Mabbit's mills. And then today, um, that same location, roughly speaking, um, is where the um, part of it is, is now parking lot and part of it is the former Isaac's restaurant. Okay, so if we go back to that blank space on the 1882 bird's eye map, I now want to look at um, the next um, lot. So Mabbitt's is between Howland and Chilton. Now we're looking between Chilton and what we call Memorial Drive. Um, and you see that since 1882, in the 30 years since 1882, um, we have new buildings that have been constructed. We have a few dwelling buildings. And then we have this um, more industrial looking building right here. And unfortunately, I don't have a photograph of it or any sort of um, other view of it other than from the bird's eye, um, other than this Sanborn map. So again, we're going back to the fire insurance map. And this is one from a little bit later than the, the, the earlier one I showed you, it's 1891. And it has depicted on here that um, building, which was owned by the Atlantic um, Covering Company. Um, and as you can say, they, they were manufacturers of magnet wire. Um, so this is a wooden building um, that notes that there was a boiler in the basement for heating only. Um, and it also notes that there's no watchman, power and lights um, are electric and then um, there water, water is in each room, water pails in each room. So that's the fire protection you have for the, uh, the manufacturers of magnet wire. Um, now this was a very short lived um, industry. Um, so starting around 1890 and then um, they appear here on the Sanborn maps and then on other uh, Sanborn maps from later years, um, the building is still there but it's no longer being used by the Atlantic Covenant Covering Company. Um, and so some of you might be saying, well, yeah, that's a that's that's strange. What I thought the Hatch House was located on that plot of land on the waterfront. And so I'll just take a small break from industry to talk about the Hedge House, which is owned by the Antiquarian Society. Um, here we have, again, that 1882 bird's eye view and that empty section of land on Water Street between Chilton and um, what what is now Ex didn't exist in 1882, but is now Memorial Drive. And I've circled here on the map um, uh, what is the Hedge House. And I'll give, get, give you a little up, closer up view. So here's Court Street. Um, you probably can easily recognize St. Peter's Church, the Catholic Church in downtown Plymouth. Um, and right across from St. Peter's, that's the Hedge House. Um, you can almost make out it has such distinctive octagonal rooms in the front section of the house. You can sort of see the strange shape of the walls that indicates um, that octagonal structure. Um, but the Hedge House was originally built in 1809 right on that location. And um, here we have a photograph of it in its original location on Court Street. Today, that is where Memorial Hall is. And it was 1918 that the last Hedge resident passed away. Um, the town purchased the property. They were going to tear down the house in order to build Memorial Hall. Um, and that is where the Plymouth Antiquarian Society stepped in, a group of local women, 
founded our organization to preserve this house from demolition and to um, to to then go on to preserve other historic houses and artifacts of Plymouth history. So what they ended up doing was moving the Hedge House from its original location on Court Street to its current location on Water Street. And in doing so, they actually um, had to rotate it so that it faced um, the water. So this is a house that was never intended to have been built on um, looking at the water. <laughs> um, and it was intended to be built looking at Court Street, the grand thoroughfare through Plymouth. Um, but we are thankful that it was saved um, and the Antiquarian Society was able to purchase a number of lots here on Water Street to create this beautiful front lawn. And um, that, that building that I mentioned, the Atlantic Covering Company's um, 1890 building that was later eventually demolished um, to, to create that lawn. So while the antiquarians saved one historic building, um, they did not think that the, um, the other was fit for, for saving. So that, that was lost to time. But in any case, so that's how we can see that one another way that the waterfront in Plymouth has changed. We have, you know, commercial, shipping, fishing, all sorts of activities happening um, in this area um, that wasn't fully developed, um, but then eventually uh, we do have one industrial building, that Atlantic Covering Company, um, and then the turnover to um, being a green space again. All right. So we're continuing on our way, um, leaving behind those vacant lots, which are, are not so vacant anymore. Um, and let's, uh, we're going back to now the industrial center that was, was based here around the railroad station. So I talked about the railroad station earlier, um, but you can see here, we have two additional um, factories on the 1882 bird's eye view. The first one, which is circled um, at the time the map was printed was the Emery boot and shoe factory. So here's another detailed view of it, um, sitting right um, facing that um, grand entrance to the railroad station right there. Um, here's the, again, an, that inset um, illustration of it from the map itself. Um, you can see that it's a four-story structure. Um, even behind the, so the left of that smokestack, we do have um, the Forefathers Monument out there. You can see that the train is coming right past the building, which provided, again, great access for getting goods into the factory and then out um, of the factory. Um, and here's a different view. This is actually an earlier um, print of that same factory. Um, but as you can see, uh, it's not called the Emory Boot and Shoe Company. It's called the Frederick Jones and Company Shoe Factory. So what happened here um, is that in 1873, the Old Colony Railroad actually donated the land where this factory um, sits on the map. Uh, they donated the land and the town um, began raising money to build a four-story factory. Um, and they wanted to attract a shoe company. So um, textiles, as we've seen, textiles production is one of the major industries. Um, we have the iron foundries, so you have iron, cast iron production. Um, we also have shoe production um, being one of these major industries that takes off um, as you can move shoe production from one cobbler's, you know, small shop and, um, you know, when the machines are, are invented that can actually produce them, the shoes, um, you can expand the production significantly. So um, we talked a little bit at the beginning about the need for capital. So this is an example of a creative way of raising capital and the idea that, well, if we bring in a company, a shoe factory to Plymouth, we can actually, um, you know, obviously it creates jobs and um, we have, we raise the capital to make that happen, to build a building so that the, um, the company can come in and occupy it. So it was Frederick Jones and company who, um, accepted the offer. They, you know, had the winning bid and they came in to create their shoe company here in Plymouth, but they actually ended up moving after a couple of years, leaving Plymouth. Um, and so the property was then, the business was then sold to Francis F. Emery Company, uh, the family of the Emery family in 1875. Um, and so that's why we have um, on the 1882 map, it's, it's labeled as the Emery um, boot and shoe factory. So boots and shoes being produced right here in Plymouth. Um, right, actually, I'm looking out the office window at the Hedge House, and so I can see the spot where it would have stood. Um, this is roughly where it is um, 
uh, where it would have been Richard's food, um, or excuse me, Richard's wine and spirits is to the right of this photograph, and that's roughly the location for that four-story shoe factory right in the heart of downtown Plymouth. But production actually ceased um, in 1899, and no other business took um, took possession of that factory building. So um, that that land was quickly redeveloped for other purposes. Um, sort of next to and behind the shoe factory and the railroad station, um, we have a much larger um, mill, mill complex, and this was the Plymouth Woolen Company. So founded in 18, 1860s, um, basically located where Hotel 1620 is today, um, you know, quite, quite a large section. Um, again, easy access to the railroad. You have the rail line coming right in to, um, to the company. Here's that inset illustration of um, the Woolen Company. Sort of an interesting uh, industrial architecture here. We have these, um, a, a bell tower and sort of a turreted, um, uh, tur turreted tower over here. So kind of a, a, probably a fairly attractive building in some ways. And here's a photograph of that, roughly the same view. So you get a sense for, for what that factory eventually looked like. Um, so the, again, the factory is started around 1863. It's sold to a different company in 1879. It's enlarged in the 1890s. Um, and then it's eventually sold to the American Woolen Company around 1900. And then it becomes known as Puritan Mills. Um, and so just like Mabbitt Mills on the other, just, just a short distance up Water Street, we have Puritan Mills here um, producing a lot of woolen goods. During World War I, it was very successful because um, the army needed uniforms, wool uniforms and wool blankets for soldiers. Um, but then after the war, Puritan Mills sort of started to decline and it closed in 1955. Um, so it did not last too very long after World War One. All right, and so finally, we are going to end by jumping from the sort of heart of the waterfront where we've been all this time, um, jumping north all the way to the Cordage Company in North Plymouth. Now, again, here's that 1910 bird's eye view. So it gives you a much larger view of the whole waterfront of Plymouth. We've been focusing on the section circled there in the red. And now we're moving to the Cordish Company to the north. And I think even just from this view, you can see that the scale is changing immensely. So the Cordage Company here um, is much larger than any of the, the individual industries we've been talking about so far. Here's the detail from that 1910 shot. And I should say, of course, that the Cordish Company um, existed when the 1882 bird's eye view map was created, but um, the bird's eye view didn't go far enough north. So that's why we have to use the 1910 map to take a look at it. Um, but you can see here a, a company that really has everything it needs. It's right on the railroad line, which at the time this map was um, printed that the railroad line had passed from the old colony railroad to the New York, New Haven and Hartford railroad. Um, so, but you have rail, rail line access. You also, um, Cordage did maintain um, access through the water. So they had their own um, ships if they needed them to go out and get materials um, or to take products out. You have the two smokestacks, which are rather distinctive um, of the Cordage company. One of them survives um, and you have all of the different mill buildings, most of which have now been demolished. Um, and although we still, this is where um, Plymouth's one train station is located today, um, we now have a large um, residential area neighborhood that's been created, Harbor Walk. But one thing that's important to note is that um, Cordage is really not just limited or the impact of Cordage is not just limited to these industrial buildings, most of which are gone, but also to um, the residential, the workers housing that they created um, in really the surrounding neighborhoods in North Plymouth, um, as well as some housing that was created for the administrators of the factory um, on Holmes Terrace and other streets. Um, so here we have Court Street coming up from downtown Plymouth. Um, you can see the Lutheran Church. Um, you, a lot of the, some of those structures still survive. Many of them still survive. So even though the, the mill buildings might be gone, you still have a lot of the legacy of Cordage right there in North Plymouth. Um, 
So Cordage was founded in 1824 by Born Spooner, who was born in 1790 and died in 1870. Um, rope making was incredibly important in um, the, the early Republic. So the, you know, it really back in, <laughs> rope making has always been important, but um, in the years following the revolution, Plymouth developed a number of rope um, making companies because of course you're trying to outfit all of the rigging for your sailing vessels. So you need a lot of rope. Um, so there are many different rope walks um, closer to the downtown Plymouth. Um, Born Spooner actually worked at a rope walk in New Orleans um, and they employed slave labor down there. Um, and so he actually came, comes back to Plymouth, um, decides to create his own rope making company. Um, and he also um, is a committed abolitionist. So he, he, he was appalled by what he saw in the South. And he said, we, I want to establish a factory where we can employ free labor. Um, and the company really blossoms. Um, the Spooner, born Spooner, again, dies in 1870. Um, members of the family remain involved, um, but it, it really grows, grows beyond the initial small rope, rope making company that it had been in 1824. Um, and actually, the, the company was able to expand in 1904. They built a second factory in um, Ontario. So um, the huge international distribution um, really was, was grew in into being one of the world's largest manufacturer of rope, um, employing thousands um, in Plymouth and um, really creating this very interesting diverse neighborhood in North Plymouth where you do have, um, um, as many of you know, a lot of Italian um, um, and other immigrant uh, families coming to live. Um, and so we eventually, Cordage survives for many, many, many decades. Um, and then there's a hostile stock takeover by the Emhart Co Corporation. And eventually um, the factory is sold in 1965 and um, ceases production. So probably one of, probably the most successful of the Plymouth industries um, that we've talked about today. Um, this is a, a wonderful photograph showing the factory. So um, the bird's eye view showed it from the water side here. We've we've changed direction. So we're looking out towards the water and you can see um, just how large the company was. All of these different um, mill buildings, rope walks. Um, here is a much later photograph. So it was actually the, it, the sign here says our 126th year Plymouth Cordage Company rope and twines. Um, and so 126 years from 1824 would be 1950 something right <laughs> should have done the math ahead of time yep 1950 exactly right um so uh we have and and this here this tower this mill entrance is is the one that remains that mill building right there um, the tower itself was built in 1885 here it is as it looks today and um, now Plymouth Cordage, Cordage Commerce Center. So um, a lot of medical offices here, um, uh, different, different types of businesses, a few restaurants. Um, you do have a remnants of the pond here with a beautiful bridge over it. And inside that final mill building, you do have um, Plymouth's own Cordage Museum operated by the Plymouth Cordage Historical Society, which um, is a really wonderful resource. And I just wanted to end today's program by talking about um, other resources that you can use if you're interested in learning more about industrial history, if you're interested in um, looking at more photographs or doing research. Um, the, I would always recommend starting with the Cordage Museum. They actually, um, again, if you enter the, the mill right um, at that tower that we looked at, um, you can just go through the doors and keep going straight and you'll see um, this entrance to the museum. They just changed their hours, so they're now open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 12 to 4. Um, but the museum has all sorts of wonderful um, artifacts, so a lot of um, archival sources as well. So a lot of um, sources that would relate if you're if you have a family member who worked at the Cordage Company, um, you know. And again, it's a long span of time, 1824 till 1960s. Um, so you, um, but they have a lot of records about. Um, um, individual workers that they've actually processed so that you can um, learn, you know, very quickly access whatever information they might have about the individual. Um, 
They also have, as I mentioned, other artifacts that, that you can see um, some machinery, a lot of samples of rope that was that were made at Cordage. Um, and again, this was started as a, a way to outfit sailing vessels, but it, the company had to evolve and change over years. So um, by the time, you know, by the 1950s, they're they're creating everything from clothing line to um, you know, twine for all sorts of purposes, um, rope for lassos. <laughs> so really just about anything that you could ever want cordage would produce if it was it was something to do with with rope. Um, so I would really highly recommend stopping by and um, exploring the Cordage Museum when they're open. Lucille Leary is the um, the, the the person um, who's leading the operation there now. Uh, unfortunately, Bill Rudolph, who was for many years uh, president of the Historical Society, passed away. Um, so, so, but Lucille is doing a wonderful job keeping keeping the doors open. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention um, is that uh, the Cordage Historical Society, the Cordage Museum, partnered with Plymouth Public Library a number of years ago to digitize um, the, their collection of Plymouth Cordage news. And so I've shared a screenshot here of the, the, the digital um, archive that you can explore right from your home computer. Um, it's available for free on Internet Archive, and you can go page by page um, and read the, mag the, the newsletter. This, so this is a, a newsletter that served different purposes. Um, there's a lot of um, articles about people who worked at Cordage, sort of human interest stories. Um, there's also a lot that was um, used to promote, you know, they're trying to promote their products, promote the business. Um, and so this is, um, I believe this, this publication was from 1945. Um, and so they were highlighting a lot of ways that the Cordage rope had been used during World War II. Um, so here's that that headline on the left side there. Here is your rope at war. Um, so so definitely tying the industrial production to sort of the the, the patriotic cause of um, serving the country during the war. Um, so those again are available through the Plymouth Public Library, um, and I've posted a link here. I'll share um, I'll share it directly with you since it's a little cumbersome to copy down and type in. Um, but those are a wonderful resource. You can also keyword search on them. So you, if you're looking for a particular person, um, you can most likely, you know, use that keyword search and hopefully find them. Um, the Plymouth Public Library also has other wonderful um, resources. And we've, we talked with Julie Burry, who's the History Room Archivist, in a previous lunchtime conversation. Um, and I think she mentioned that they do have a large collection related to Sacco and Vanzetti, the, um, the, uh, the, the the robbery case that um, went to trial um, in 1921 and was um, well was connected to Plymouth because of um, the one of one of them had actually worked at the Cordage Company briefly. Um, so there are all sorts of notes that include um, uh, interviews with people who lived in North Plymouth and 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 knew um, um, and knew him. So that's another source that you might want to be interested in, in looking into. Um, and then here at the Antiquarian Society, I wanted to share that we, we have a large collection of photographs that were taken in um, mostly in the 1940s and early 1950s, some in the 1930s. Um, but these were taken by um, a local photographer named E.P. McLaughlin, and um, they were mostly they were staged photographs so I, I think he was hired by the Plymouth Cordage Company to come in um, and photograph um, the machines so photograph the operations photograph people at work um, as you see in this photograph on the left um, and and also photograph um, products so here in the photograph on the bottom center you see all sorts of twine and line um, that was um, being used so lariat ropes those are my favorite um, so, so we have this wonderful photograph collection of the Cordage Company, and many of them we have scanned and shared with um, um, with our with our friends at the Cordage Museum. And and so, if, again, if you're interested in a particular um, topic or research project related to Plymouth Cordage Company, that is something that we have that we can offer to you. Um, and. That is um, it for today. I've done a terrible job looking at questions. Um, so, oh, great. Okay, I see a couple of questions. We have a few minutes left for us to answer them. Um, so an earlier question, where were the hedge bricks manufactured? Um, that's a great question. Let's go back to this map and see. Um, um, 
So there was um, Hedges Pond in um, North Plymouth where um, the brick company was. So the, the, the Hedge Bricks were, the company was started by Barnabas Hedge, who was the father of Thomas Hedge, who lived here in what's now the Hedge House Museum. Um, and so the company was continued by um, Thomas and his brother Isaac Luthrop Hedge. So sometimes many places around Plymouth you'll see um, bricks. If, they, if you've taken down an old building, you might find bricks that are stamped either B Hedge or um, I. L. Hedge for Isaac Luther Hedge, um, and actually, um, brick making was another major industry in Plymouth in the earlier years, um, uh, which we we didn't talk about. But one reason for that was because there was um, a, a great. I mean, there's a lot of clay, natural clay in um, in Plymouth. So so resources that material. Do you have the material to make what you need? Well, um, you don't want to make bricks if you don't have the resources readily available. And certainly, if you have a large supply of clay, then you can make bricks um, fairly. Um, that's, that's a huge part of what you need. So, um, so that was one reason why we were a brick, a brick manufactory here in Plymouth. Um, Catherine asked what time, what year did the Cordage Company close? And I believe it was, it was 1965 that they were bought out. Um, so they sort of wind, uh, ended operations sor shortly after that. But I hope um, if someone knows an exact date for that, I hope that they can, um, share that with us. That's another reason to pop in and see the Cordage Company Museum right there in the old mill building. So some um, some of our uh, attendees today are noting that they um, they worked in in Mabbitt's mill um, and um, that's that's wonderful. Again, I think a lot of that history is important to preserve because in so many ways we have lost sight of Plymouth's industrial past and we forget that um, in the 19th and 20th century, um, it, what, it these industries were what brought people to Plymouth. They provided jobs for people in Plymouth. They um, provided wealth. They increased the wealth of some people in Plymouth and um, they really shaped the landscape here. So as we've gone and we've um, you know, we had the tercentenary in 1920, 21. Um, that changed a lot of the landscape. Um, a lot, of course, just as as we continue to um, redevelop certain areas of Plymouth, um, that history has been has been lost in some ways because it's not in front of us anymore. So hopefully, this tour gave you a chance to go ahead and um, and and see uh, see see through these maps and through photographs that the, these industries did exist. Um, and Lucille Leary, who I mentioned, is the um, the leader over there at the Cordage Museum. She did just confirm. Thank you, Lucille, that uh, Cordage closed in 1965. So um, thank you very much for that, Lucille. Um, and I can actually. Um, just say before before I, I know we are at um, we also had people watching on Facebook now I'm looking at the Facebook stream just to see if I, I know I missed what watching it during the um, program um, and people are noting that they wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the cordage because that's absolutely right people came and they stayed and they did work hard um, to develop um, you know, to, to create a community in North Plymouth. Um, and one person's noting fa family members from the British Isles who came to North Plymouth because of the factory, right? So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very interesting story because people are coming from all over the world, came from all over the world to work um, at the Cordage Company and at, at the other mills as well. And so that's one of those poles of immigration. You need, you need something pulling them to a certain place. Um, and so um, some of these factories, and especially the Cordage Company, were reasons for people to come to Plymouth. Um, so as we close up, I just wanted to um, thank you again for being here and, and remind you that this is recorded so you can for sure go back and watch it and share it. Um, we are going to take a break from lunchtime conversations now that the sim summer is in full swing. Um, we've we've been doing them since February, I think, and um, so we're just going to take a short break for the rest of the summer, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to pick them up virtually in the fall. Um, but I did want to invite you to attend on the first Saturday of August, so that's August 7th at 1 p.m. Um, I'll be doing our first Saturday history tours, which have been virtual 
virtual in 2021 because of um, COVID, of course. So we um, present these tours in partnership with Pilgrim Hall Museum. And so my tour on um, Saturday, August 7th will be about the first immigrant neighborhoods in Plymouth. And so what I'm hoping to do is to do something very similar to this tour where we took the maps and walked along and, and sort of zoomed in to see where people were, um, where these factories were. I'd like to do that and zoom in and think about the di different immigrant neighborhoods that that came about um, or that grew as people um, came to Plymouth and as these factories grew and developed and different people re recruited for different jobs. Um, so we're going to be looking at immigration to Plymouth in that um, virtual tour that's that's happening on Saturday, August 7th. Um, but we do have a lot of in-person events happening um, here in Plymouth. All three of our historic houses are open for tours. We're always free for Plymouth residents and PAS members. So if you haven't been in a while, please do stop by. We'd love to see you. Our hours are on our website, PlymouthAntiquarian.org. Um, tomorrow night, Thursday at seven o'clock, we also have a special community gathering the Plymouth Bay Cultural District has partnered with the Community Art Collaborative to create a community art um, sculpture that, that is temporarily installed in the Hedge House lawn through November. So that will be unveiled tomorrow, Thursday at 7 p.m. And um, it was work was contributed by local students and other artists and um, there's poetry. Uh, by Stephen Delbos, who is Plymouth Poet Laureate, and we were um, highlighting some stories of perseverance in Plymouth's past and looking at people who came before us and, um, you know, what what sort of circumstances did they um, did, did they endure and push through and um, fight for different causes. So that's something that I encourage you to come visit. Um, and then also we do open the Hedge House for our special First Fridays tour as part of Art Walk. So Plymouth Art Walk is a new endeavor this year. So it's the first Friday of every month from 5 to 8 p.m. And at the Hedge House, we're open for free for mini tours, and we highlight a different theme each month. So again, the first Friday in August, which I think is August 6th, we will be highlighting the wallpaper that you can see in the Hedge House. So we'll just be talking about wallpaper. So if you love wallpaper or are interested in it, come on down for that. Um, and then the next free Friday, first Fridays um, goes through October. So you can get out and see what other um, art galleries, the Art Center on North Street, different studios, different um, uh, uh, businesses and restaurants downtown have, have different activities too. So it's, it's a great um, event here locally. Um, and then finally, if you're um, if you have kids or grandkids who are local or who are going to come stay with you, we are holding an in-person kids summer program the first week of August. Um, Pre-registration is required for that, so um, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me um, or, or 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 find that information on our website. But we are very excited that in just a couple of weeks we'll be able to explore local history with some young history lovers, and we have a few spots available. So it's a very small program um, just to, to make sure we're following all the guidelines for health and safety, but we do have a few spots available if you have a, a young person ages 8 to 12 who'd like to join us. So those are my announcements um, for today and um, I will uh, be posting some links so that you can have the links to the different things I've mentioned. Um, if you've attended via the Zoom webinar, I will send out a survey so you can um, provide feedback. And actually, the idea for this program came from one of the surveys that we did for an earlier lunchtime conversation. So if you have ideas for programs, put them on the survey and we'd love to, to see if we can work with them. Um, we have, oh, there's one question here that I can answer. Um, there is will there be an antiquarian fair this August? So it's a great question. We normally do have a summer fair um, on the Hedge House lawn and we are going ahead with that this year. Um, it's going to be scaled down a bit. So um, it, it coincides with the Plymouth Chamber of Commerce's Waterfront Festival. And that is the last Saturday in August, August 28th. So um, they will be on Water Street and we will be on the Hedge House lawn. Um, normally we would be requesting donations and um, recruiting volunteers for, for all sorts of different things, but we are keeping it somewhat smaller this year just because of everything that's been going on. Um, but we do hope you'll join us for that so you can stop by, um, browse the fair and, and see what else we might have going on that day. Okay, so I think, um, Thank you all for your kind comments as you've you've 
um, sent in some chats and, and different things. Um, and I hope you'll join us for, for that virtual program on August 7th, or if not for an in-person program, or again, find them all on our website and um, keep exploring Plymouth history. Thank you so much all for your support and have a wonderful, a wonderful um, afternoon. Take care all.